World Championship Wrestling, the WCW, it was so impactful to professional wrestling. It is not a name that you hear often anymore, considering that they haven't really existed since 2001, but I don't think that this is something we should forget about. I think any longtime wrestling fan would agree that the WCW is easily among the most important wrestling promotions ever to exist, and definitely among the most popular. In fact, considering the way things are today, this may be hard to believe, but for a brief time in the 1990s, the WCW was actually getting more attention than the WWF. Here is the best way that I know how to express that. Do you know how they have Monday Night Raw? Well, the WCW used to have Monday Nitro. It was a very comparable, directly competing show. And for 84 consecutive weeks, from May of 1996 through March of 1998, Nitro was the more popular one. Yet, three years later, the show was canceled, and by the end of that year, the WCW was pretty much finished. It was actually bought by the WWF. WF, transferring all the ownership of all their previous content, some of the wrestler contracts, and the name itself. So today, I want to talk about the WCW, how they quickly rose to the top of their industry, and what went wrong from there. The origins of the WCW can be traced back in different directions, going as far back as the 1940s, but what I consider to be the more relevant story here starts in the 1970s, with two local businesses, both in Georgia. On one end, we have a wrestling promotion called Georgia Championship Wrestling wrestling, and on the other end, we have Ted Turner's company, Turner Broadcasting. And in case you don't know about Ted Turner, he's famous for establishing multiple television channels including TBS, TNT, CNN, and even the Cartoon Network. He is also known for his affiliation with Atlanta, in that that's where his company and all of his channels were started in headquarters, and for decades, he was the owner of the Major League Baseball team, the Atlanta Braves. So in 1972, while this big media empire was still emerging, he made a contract with this regional wrestling promotion called Georgia Championship Wrestling for their program to be shown on his regional television channel WTCG. The TCG stood for Turner Communications Group, but in the advertisements, they said that the whole thing stood for Watch This Channel Grow. I mention that because the channel did grow. Four years later, TBS was established, the Superstation, with the purpose of broadcasting the programming from WTCG out to the rest of the country, meaning Georgia Championship Wrestling was now being seen by a national audience. In an effort to better relate to the rest of the country and to brand themselves to a wider audience, they changed the name of the entire show from Georgia Championship Wrestling to World Championship Wrestling, better known as WCW. Well, technically, it was just the name of the show that changed, not the entire promotion. That didn't happen until a few years later. But just to keep things simple, I will be calling it WCW from this point. Now, obviously, the biggest competition for the WCW was the WWF, which, of course, was operated by Vince McMahon. Man. See, his stuff was already airing nationally on the USA Network, and considering that the WCW on TBS was the only other wrestling show occupying a national time slot, he was very interested in obtaining it. Conveniently, the ownership of the WCW had been changing over the past few years, and the current owners were having disagreements. Vince McMahon took this as an opportunity to swoop in and convince some of the owners to sell him their share of the business, effectively making him the new owner owner, both of the company and that time slot. When he took it over on July 14th, 1984, it was such a disaster that it is now referred to as Black Saturday. He had replaced the WCW wrestling that the viewers had been tuning into for years at this point with essentially a highlight reel of his other WWF broadcast, which proved to be a bad decision on multiple levels. His content was considered to be more of a northern style based on the characters and storylines. I mean, it's Vince McMahon. While the WCW had traditionally been more of a southern style that was centered more around the actual sport of wrestling, the audience was very upset with this transition, the ratings were just terrible, and as the owner of this station, Ted Turner was not happy about it. It was all a disaster. It led to Vince McMahon giving up the time slot and the WCW to Jim Crockett Promotion, who as the name implies was the owner of other smaller wrestling promotions. From there, things went bad for them. One of the wrestlers, Magnum TA, was forced 
to retire following a car accident a couple months before his title match. They moved some of their pay-per-view matches up north, and that didn't sit well with their mostly southern fan base. And through all of this, they were expected to compete with the WWF, which led to higher costs as far as retaining talent and lower sales. A bad combination that was thought to be leading them toward bankruptcy. So in 1988, they sold the majority of Jim Crockett promotions to Ted Turner, which I think anyway is one of the best things that could have possibly happened to the WCW. Really, I'm gonna say that this is the biggest reason that they rose to the top, because just think about it. Given his history of showing it on his stations for the past 16 years, I think we can say that he respects professional wrestling and sees the market potential for it. But on top of that, he owned the mediums to put it out there, he had more than enough money to fund it, and given his history in dealing with Vince McMahon and the WWF, he had a personal motivation to try to beat them. So given his resources and motivation, he was able to turn it into something big, and one of his methods was attracting high-profile wrestlers away from the WWF. The list of them could seem like it's endless, but some of the more notable ones would be Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart, Randy Savage, and Ric Flair. Ric Flair actually went back and forth, so trust me when I say that there is an extended story behind every one of these. Like, when WWF Women's Champion Alundra Blaze publicly switched to the WCW while throwing her title in the garbage. But without drilling further into each one, I'll simply say that a new promotion of this size with this amount of funding was able to make attractive offers to many of these wrestlers. Another reason would be Nitro itself. Vince McMahon started Raw in 1993, and after seeing the success of it, Ted Turner started Nitro two and a half years later during the same time slot on his own channel, TNT. The two shows had the same overall idea, possibly with the biggest difference being that Nitro was live while Raw was recorded almost a week in advance. It gave Nitro more of an unpredictable feeling that people responded to, and it didn't even take one year for it to pull ahead in ratings. Plus, the storylines, specifically everything that was going on with Hollywood Hulk Hogan in the NWO. I mean, Hulk Hogan turning heel and leading the New World Order was more compelling than anything that was happening over at the WWF. Alright, there's way more to it, of course, but I think we can see how the WCW was gaining momentum here. So now, let's talk about the other side and where everything went wrong. First off, I think many would agree that the whole thing was getting a little stale. To me, I'm sure you might know this, it's a lot like that episode of Spongebob where he just keeps ripping his pants. At first, it was funny, but then after seeing the response, he kept doing it to a point where it was just more annoying than anything else. People were tired of it. I feel like the WCW did find things that worked well as far as storylines and superstars, so they kept doing the same thing. Much like Spongebob ripping his pants, that Hulk Hogan NWO thing was amazing at first, but after a while, people have had enough. Same thing with the superstars. To keep things fresh, you have to be able to constantly be creating new ones. The WWF is like a machine when it comes to that. I should say that there are some examples like Goldberg and DDP that came from the WCW, but I think that most would agree that they became far too reliant on the same rotation of aging stars, most of which were originally made famous through the WWF anyway. On top of that, they had some sad gimmicks. I guess the most notable example here would be the time that actor David Arquette was in a match to promote his movie Ready to Rumble and actually ended up walking away with the title. A good example of both of these at once would be 1999's Finger Poke of Doom. I know, it sounds scary, and maybe it is, because for many people, this is considered to be the point of no return. It involved Hulk Hogan somehow defeating Kevin Nash and winning the title by poking him in the chest. I, I I don't know, it's silly, but it led to the reforming of the NWO, essentially using a poorly received gimmick to revitalize a stale storyline, perfectly summarizing the later years of Nitro. And as if that wasn't enough, on that same night, the announcer told the audience that Mankind was going to win the Raw Championship on the other channel. Him saying it was meant to prevent people from switching over, but it backfired because it turns out everyone wanted to watch Mankind win that championship. A bunch of people switched over the channel, and I think the whole thing exposed how the audience now preferred what was happening in the WWF. It leads me to my next reason, the WWF's Attitude Era. It was pretty much a direct result of these Monday Night TV wars. In 1997, right in the middle of their 84-week losing streak, the WWF started the Attitude Era as a successful attempt to raise their ratings. It involved everything becoming more violent and edgier as an attempt to attract the previously uninterested 
demographic of younger adults. I'm sure that pretty much every wrestling fan knows about the Attitude Era, so I just want to say here that it was an effective way of drawing an audience away from the WCW. My next reason would be financial trouble, because with lower ratings, they were making less money, while some of their costs were going up. Really, they always had to pay big money contracts to maintain the wrestlers, but now, with the WCW heading in such a bad direction, it was costing even more money to convince them. And that's if they were even able to do it. Some of the wrestlers, such as Chris Jericho and The Big Show, left to go to the WWF. It is believed that they lost around $80 million in their final year. Then, my final reason behind the downfall of the WCW would be acquisitions. In 1996, Turner was bought by Time Warner, who then a few years later merged with AOL in what turned out to be one of the biggest, most disastrous mergers of all time. With new owners, there were new managers and a new business plan. It was no longer Ted Turner making the decisions. I have to think that the new people looked at the WCW, saw that it was losing a ton of money, and since it wasn't exactly the image that they were trying to portray anyway, it concluded that it wasn't worth the time and money that it would take to try to save it. So instead, they canceled WCW Nitro, and a few months later, sold most of the assets to Vince McMahon, and that's about the end of it. In the end, the entire existence of the WCW, as most people know it, lasted for about 12 years, which I don't think is very long considering how much of an impact that they made. Just take a look at the popularity of professional wrestling, and in my opinion, the entertainment value before and after the WCW. If for nothing else, I'm pretty sure that we would not have had the Attitude Era without them, or many of the stars that emerged from it. I'm confident in saying that the WWF and all of professional wrestling since the early 1990s would look entirely different otherwise. Let me know in the comments, were you a fan of the WCW? And if you were, do you agree with the reasons that I gave for their downfall? And I do realize that this is very simplified. Keep in mind that I wanted to make this video for a general audience and keep it within a certain time frame, so I chose to stick to what I consider to be the more important aspects of it. So if you think that Eric Bischoff or Goldberg's winning streak or WCW Thunder were big factors, please let me know. And how about Sting? I had to put him in here somewhere because I'm not going to make a whole video about the WCW and not mention Sting. You can see how much there is here, so any other thoughts you have about the rise and fall of the WCW, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.